Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll just give uh, a few moments here while more people are joining. I hope everyone can hear me. If not, please comment in the chat on the side. I think we're talking more about COVID right now. <laughs> okay, Thomas is giving the go ahead. It's, it's time for some uh, science. Uh, welcome everyone, wherever you are around the world and whatever time it is for you. It's my pleasure to introduce our, our uh, second keynote speaker. Before then, I'm just gonna give a, a few points. I'm sure all of you are now experts um, with Crowdcast, but you're welcome to chat on the side. But if you do have questions, please click the Ask Question button. Um, there is also another session later on today uh, to follow up with questions that don't get covered uh, during this session. Um, so for this session, I'll probably just read out um, questions that people have, but in the, the second Q&A, um, I'll invite people on screen so that we can have more of a dialogue. Okay, so without further ado, I'm, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Xiaoping Li. Um, I'll give a quick introduction uh, to her background. She completed her undergraduate training in physics at Fudan University in Shanghai, and was the only woman to win first place in China's annual national physics competition, which ran between 1979 in 1989. Um, she moved to Caltech where she completed her PhD working with John Hopfield and spent postdoctoral time at Fermi National uh, Lab, Princeton and Rockefeller uh, before becoming assistant professor at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology after a short stint at MIT. Um, she moved to the University College London in 1998 where she co-founded the Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit. Uh, there she progressed through the ranks uh, and in 2018, she moved to the U University of Tübingen, uh, where she's now Professor of Computer Science and Head of the Department of Sensory and Sensory Motor Systems at the Max Planck Institute of Biological Cybernetics. The aim of her lab is to understand and discover how the brain receives and encodes sensory input, both vision, audit audition, tactile sensation, and olfaction, and processes the information to direct body movements as well as to make cognitive decisions. The research is highly interdisciplinary, uses theoretical as well as experimental approaches, which I'm sure you're going to hear about today. The title of her talk is A New Computational Framework for Understanding Vision in Our Brain. And I hand it over to our speaker this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve, for a very kind introduction. And uh, I have been enjoying the CNS 2020 a lot. It's tremendous success, uh, considering that this is the first time. And yesterday I've been having a lot of fun. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity to continue to have fun today with you. And uh, yeah, in particular, to share with you uh, some of the things we've been doing over the uh, last 20 years, and it's getting um, um, something new. And uh, I'd love to hear your feedback, and we can continue discussion later today as well. And so the new framework, then people, uh, you may, you know, this is the human brain, and, and this is actually on the right, it's the monkey brain when it's open up, but they are both, both primates, yeah, from retina to primordial cortex and so on. But first of all, you may say, why do we need a new framework? And what is the old or traditional framework? And so one of them is this more or less feature detector framework, and it's been very successful, starting with Hugo Weasel, where uh, they uh, electrophysiologically try to measure neural responses uh, to uh, stimulus on a visual screen. And there are uh, famous work of orientation selective neurons come out of uh, that. And uh, that's amazing 50 years ago, yeah, 50, 60 years ago. However, this framework seemed to be getting more difficult as people move it further from V1 to V2 and V3 to V4, such that they actually criticized us, the new generation, that more or less we haven't made much progress since what they did. That's perhaps quite harsh, but nevertheless, need to make us pause and think what happened, especially as a computational scientist, you say, hmm, have we asked the wrong question? Why is it sudden progress and then slow progress or no progress? Of course, people have been asking questions. So another framework, for instance, one representation is a uh, um, well-known one is by David Ma, computationally, what is vision doing? And he proposed that there's three stages, primal sketch, two and a half D sketch, and 3D model. Well, this is almost 40 years ago. So 
it's also, you know, a lot of inspiration, especially when I was studying in my graduate school. And uh, in comparison, the success is not as much compared to this uh, inspiration. So it, what is it, the problem? What is the question? Maybe we, we have been asking the question, but still not the right question. And so I like to share with you what I've been thinking. And basically, there's an elephant in the room. And what is it? It's attentional bottleneck, yeah? And this elephant may be very visible, maybe not very visible, depending on your perspective, yeah? And so, um, you know, because we have information bottleneck, we know we are attentionally blind to whatever we are not paying attention to. So if you do not have bottleneck, you would see the differences between these two images immediately. However, you don't see them as you know if, if this is the first time you see. It. So for instance, here there is no airplane engine. Here's an airplane engine. Yeah. So our attentional bottleneck make us unable to see this difference unless I point out to you, unless you're lucky, or unless somebody else, you know, you know, you've seen it before, or something like that. Another thing, the reason we were not aware of this uh, elephant in a room is we felt that maybe this is something way high level, maybe in the frontal brain, you know, it's not as, uh, as something we should worry about now, maybe late. Okay, so this elephant in a room has been kind of a not being paid attention to. But I like to advocate this is the reason that maybe we were uh, not making as much progress in the traditional framework. And in particular, I'm going to put this elephant in the middle, in a really the center stage in this uh, framework. So vision is composed of um, three different stages from what David Ma had been saying. So encoding, just representing information in the neural firings, in the retina, for example. And selection, you, you know, so the idea is you have lots of information coming in. How many inf in information? So in humans, like 20 uh, pictures per second, that's about 20 megabytes per second. That's a lot of information. However, the bottleneck only allows less than 1% of that passing through. So this is really uh, quite serious. And uh, what if this bottleneck starts right at V1? Okay. And I'm going to say, yes, indeed, it starts right at V1. That means after V1, the information is more or less lost by a large amount, maybe not suddenly all the way down to the 1%, maybe. But even if it's just lost at starting at V1, 50% lost or, uh, or something, it's, it's dramatic. So when you can measure as the field like Hugo Weasel in V1, where before the information loss, it's much easier. But at V2, once information starts to loss, you cannot measure the field as successfully. This could be the reason why the progress is much more difficult after V1. Yeah? But nevertheless, you know, this is only an initial guess. Let's see how well can we make progress in this new framework. So if information is much lost after V1, then if you want to recognize it, hey, is it really an elephant or not? It's really a mountain or tree trunk you may have to go back to V1 to query for more information, okay? Now, this query can be done in an attentional bottleneck, a very narrow bottleneck, because you are not only querying for specific information. Is it an elephant or it's a tree trunk, yeah? And so that's one bit of information. And then you can do that query when you can be so narrowed down to a few alternatives. Not like, oh, is it an elephant, is it a tree, is it a, uh, is a mountain, is a face, is an indoor outboard. If you have too much information in general, then you cannot query as easily. So that's the basic idea. And so let's look in more detail. In particular, it's worth expanding. The information indeed is coming in about 20 megabytes per second, which is 20 frames per second in about uh, 10 to 100 millions of photoreceptors, depending on how you count them. And this is how much information. This is about 10 or 20 books per second because, you know, text of book is that much of information. You cannot read each second that much. So therefore, at the retina, you can just compress it a little bit, but the compression is limited. So even after the retina compression, you still have a whole huge book. You can't read that much. So therefore, you just have to select. And envision how do we select? We select by looking around. That's the major source of selection. So here is how we uh, the gaze goes around. When we look at this and say, huh, that's David. Hmm, then go over there. Maybe 
let's Henry or go over here, you know, let's let's John or so on. Yeah. So so whatever you selected is is going through this narrow bottleneck of 40 bits per second. And so you 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 go read, okay, that's you know less than one page of information, or maybe in fact it's only about two sentences, 40 bits about two cent two short sentences of information. And that's how you select. So therefore, selection is in colloquial term is looking. Okay, you decide which two sentences in this huge book to read. So you have to select which two sentences is looking. And we select by shifting our gaze. Once we shift our gaze, then we read. So we say, hey, who is that? Is that David? And so on. Yeah. And then and so therefore selection is more or less done in the whole visual field. You, you say, where is do I select something to the left or to the top, to the bottom? And so the whole visual peripheral vision is telling you to go this way or that way. But once you select it, whatever you select, you put in your central visual field. So seeing part, that's where you decode to infer that's a face or an elephant or a tree or whatever. It's in your central visual field. And so this is uh, the skeleton of this new framework. And this is quite a, quite a, uh, a, 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 a and this also implies that a lot of information is lost beyond V1. And there will be a cooperation between V1 and the extra strike cortex. You may, once you see roughly something, you may go back and reselect and so on. There could be a loop around here. However, you may, you may say, gee, this is really quite a, 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 a lot to assume that V1 is doing the selection. So let's do a, a little um, detour, yeah, a little uh, excursion into showing you that indeed there's a good reason to believe selection starts at V1. Okay, that means it is guiding you where to look. If it's guiding your gaze, the selection is already starting. And so this was my uh, computational hypothesis, which I uh, proposed more than 20 years ago, and where I proposed that given the retina input in V1, you create a saliency map such that within this map, the highlight location is where it makes you select to direct your gaze. And this saliency map is actually a traditional idea in psychology, didn't have uh, as much uh, com uh, neural correlate. And uh, therefore, I propose that this is actually the V1 firing rate. The highest firing rate to any visual location is representing the saliency map. And you notice that that doesn't make sense because in V1, you have mono project uh, monosynaptic projection from V1 to superior curriculus, which then goes to the brainstem to direct our eye movement. And so anatomical pathways make it feasible to do this selection. So therefore, the saliency map is actually read out by the superior colleagues that takes the winner from the saliency map and then make the muscle be moved eye to that most salient location. Okay. And, uh, and this means, you know, the, it actually the, the reason it, it could select this way is because V1 is actually a recurrent circuit. It doesn't just only take... Uh, uh, the visual input through its small rest of field. The, between local rest of the field, there's recurrent interaction such that, you know, for instance, this is a, a picture of V1 I uh, took from Boston et al.'s paper, which is about three millimeter by three millimeter uh, area. And all these colored uh, patches are visualizing the orientation tuning columns. So for instance, if the patch is blue, it means this local neurons in this blue patches are tuned to vertical. If the patch is more reddish, that means local neurons in that patch is tuned to horizontal, etc. And on this patch, you see there is a um, black uh, parameter cell. Its cell body is actually within this blue patch. That means it's preferring vertical orientation. And it's sending axon characters also nearby up to about two to four millimeters long, which is about, uh, you know, about a few hypercolumn distances. And you see that it's preferentially snapping into all the also blue colored patches. That means it's snapping onto post-synaptic cells that are also preferring vertical orientation. Turns out most of the synapses are actually onto the local interneurons uh, so that it's actually doing dye snap inhibition. So it's inhibiting other neurons are also tuned to vertical. So vertical neuron, vertical neuron inhibiting each other. Horizontal, horizontal neuron inhibit each other. This is called light to like uh, suppression. Okay. So therefore, if you have an image made of lots of horizontal bars and one single vertical bar, the neurons tuned to horizontal responding to these horizontal bars will inhibit each other through these light to like suppression. 
and this horse vertical bar is the only neuron that's not getting inhibited by all the horizontal neurons nearby. So it escapes the inhibition. That's why its response is the highest in this uh, location. And this makes it able to um, signal and make this bar more salient according to the salient in that hypothesis. Similarly, of course, at this location, you can have other neurons uh, let's say another neuron turned to uh, uh, red. So in this another retinal image, the middle retinal image, uh, the neuron turned to red is the only one not suppressed by neuron turned to blue, while all the neurons turned to blue are suppressing each other. So this like-to-like -like suppression also applies to uh, another feature, which is color dimensional feature. Yeah, and so similarly, you can have to. Uh, 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 so so therefore, uh, you can. Uh, this one somehow is not moving. Yeah. Similarly, you can have you know only neuron that's moving. If if a bar is moving, then the neurons turn to that's moving direction will be activated, and that's the only one escaping isomotion direction suppression. So this highest location response could be from any neuron. Okay, it could be a neuron turned to vertical, could be a neuron turned to red, and so on. But nevertheless, it, all its firing rate that matter to the superacuricus, which was that location to make you gaze shift to the most salient location, whether it's by orientation or color or by motion. And from this, you actually can predict something that's very surprising and what's unexpected. There's something that's invisible in its unique feature it can attract your attention. So here, the salient bar is visibly uniquely vertical. This is physically, visibly unique red. This is visibly uniquely moving. So what is the visual feature that is unique but invisible to you that you can still attract your attention? And that's predicted by the theory. This is actually like this. Imagine you have a visual input composed of lots of uh, orange bars. They all tilted to the left except for one bar tilted to the right. However, you show this image to observers making them wear stereo goggles such that you show all of these bars to their left eye not to their right eye. If they do not cheat by closing the left or right eye, they would not realize. They would think that both of their eyes see all these bars. And so therefore, their fused perception is just all these bars. Okay, and if you give them a task, say, look for the uniquely tilted bar, they will immediately find this uniquely tilted bar because it's salient, according to this. Um, and so they can find this bar within half a second. However, if you take one of the non-target bars from the left eye and put it in the same location in the right eye. Now what observer sees is still the same image because they cannot tell the difference. And by the V1 saliency hypothesis, so when you have light to light suppression, this bar is nobody is suppressing it because this will activate uh, 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 V1 neuron turned to the right eye and this neuron is not suppressed by all these neurons turned to the left eye. So therefore, this bar will also evoke higher responses, just like that bar evoke higher response because it's uniquely tilted. This is uniquely uh, to the right eye. So therefore, you have two locations that's very salient for two different reasons. And which one will attract your attention? So by V1 saliency hypothesis, that both of them will attract and so attract your attention. Therefore, if you ask observer to find a uniquely oriented bar, which is here, that bar will interfere. And that's the prediction, even though the observers cannot tell the distinctiveness of this bar. And when we experimentally tested, that's indeed the case. Observers' first gaze shift usually is three out of four times going to that bar before they actually go to target. Even though you ask this observer, they have to find a uniquely tilted bar as soon as possible. Yeah, and so this is really a fingerprint of V1 because only V1 among all cortical areas have the, has this substantial information about which eye gives that input. By V2, all neurons are binocular neurons, more or less, such that you cannot tell. And this is the reason why humans cannot tell that this part is any distinctive because beyond V1, you don't have that information left. And here is also a, a, a demonstration showing that you can look. This is a motor action of shifting your gaze. You look at this bar without seeing why you wanted to look at it. In fact, a lot of observers even deny they ever look that way before they go that way. So this is an example that looking, visual selection is indeed before seeing. 
and then and uh, it's a fingerprinting of V1. And it's very easily reproducible by other groups because all you need is a visual display with steroid uh, goggles, uh, 3D movies. That's all you can do. So this is a very robust phenomenon, easily reproducible. So, and later on, I uh, collaborated with my collaborator Wu Li uh, in Beijing Normal University and his colleague Yan Ying. And we tested on monkeys doing these visual search tasks. We, we make monkeys fixate to a central spot. Once they fixate it, we flash down these bars and they're all oriented the same way, except one of them tilted in a different way. Okay, this uniquely oriented bar is salient. But it's unpredictable whether it's here or there or where in here. There's all six possible locations. And so the monkey's task is as soon as possible, as quickly as possible, find where it is and succumb to it. Okay. Now, however, um, uh, this saccade will take 200 milliseconds before they, they can succumb to it. So therefore, within that 200 milliseconds, you can measure neurons response to the bars. Okay. And so let's say this is the uh, one of the uh, electrode is measuring the the field here to this neuron or uh, to this bar. And he these are the neural responses. This is horizontal axis is time since these bars onset. And usually V1's response starts about 40 millisecond and just peak and initial peak response and then drops down before 100 millisecond. And then about 200 millisecond around this time, then it's a card. Okay. But you can see that we plotted this V1's neural responses. And among the same kind of trials interleave with many other trials, because some other trials you have them uniquely tilted by somewhere else. But anyway, there's about 30 trials of these kind of stimulus, okay, interleave with hundreds of other trials. You select these 30 trials to just sort them out and sort them according to how fast the monkey can saccade to this bar. And so you can put 15 trials, that's the faster trials, and the other 15 trials, you know, sort them out according to how fast and how slow. Then you find that for those trials that have faster saccad and saccad to the right location, they have higher firing rate compared to those trials have slower saccad or the monkey even failed to saccad to the right location and so on, or didn't even saccad at all. Okay, and you can see the difference start to appear around 40, 50 milliseconds. That's really, really fast. And because it's such a short latency and it's also before the the monkeys make that and there's no other brain area can feed back to v1 to give that signal because it's just too short not even the superior colliculus superior colliculus onset latency is actually uh, uh, less than uh, uh, longer than v1's so this gives a strong evidence with simultaneous behavior and ph physiological recording uh, showing a supporting evidence that v1 is the salient signal and I'm not going to elaborate in details, but uh, there's also collaboration with my former postdoc, uh, uh, Asuka Kong, and later a student, uh, Lee. We find that you can also use this V1 CDNC hypothesis of Vish to predict reaction times with zero parameters. Okay, You find that predicted reaction time by this V1 hypothesis 100% fully explains the reaction time. That, that means it doesn't require any other brain area to be involved in this bottom-up series, okay, I'm not talking about top-down attentional selection, completely bottom-up stimulus-driven attentional selection. It looks like V1 alone is sufficient. Um, so this is a short detour to just uh, put the background saying that, yeah, it does make sense in this new framework that selection, the elephant in the room, really starts very early, right at V1, okay? And so if that's the case, the rest of the visual system, how it works, really has to be uh, thought of in light of this information. Okay, so in particular, all this information coming, a flood of information coming, and after V1, it just trickled down. And then if you can't see clearly, you have to feedback and query for more information. And since by then you have already shifted your eye to look at whatever you selected, all you need to query is in central frame, central vision. So therefore, identifying selection enables us to ask these questions, you know, feedback should be in central vision, it helps us to ask this question, okay. So in particular, let me uh, spell elaborate with you, um, spell it out more clearly. Imagine from the retina all the flood of information coming in and then by V1 you have this information, I give a little bit smear down in the periphery because we do have some resolution difference between central peripheral uh, locations. 
Imagine you have already selected to look at this flower by then. Okay, you suck up to this flower. But then even after you selected the information further downstream, just trickling down such that you don't send all information upstream. So information bottleneck starts. It starts even within the central visual field. Okay, even you selected this location. Hey, what is it? You, you, you know, the information is very poor, impoverished. You say, hmm, is it really a red flower? You say, well, maybe it's a leopard. You know, maybe it's a, who knows, a brown dirty patch or something. But anyway, flower or leopard, you may want to disambiguate. And so you go back and query for specifics. Say, is it flower or red leopard? Let's just query for one bit of information, okay? And there you can do it only in central vision. Okay, I mean, not, you, know, you only need to do it in central vision because that's where your attentional uh, spotlight is. You just do that, query for that specific information. If you want to query for too much information, maybe, you know, this attentional bottleneck wouldn't even let you do that, okay? And that means you don't do that as much in the periphery. So this is the central peripheral dichotomy. And even though this is an argue from a computational argument that, okay, you already selected, in fact, there's behavioral data to, to, to motivate you in support of this. But in any way, because in the periphery, you don't do that. So in periphery, it can be, you know, not only is ambiguous, is it a stick figure of somebody, you know, you cannot be sure. So therefore, you can see ghosts and other things in periphery. So therefore, one prediction is, it's more likely that you're going to have illusions in periphery. Okay, so let's have some fun. Let me share some illusions with you. This is a famous illusion, Herman grid, scintillation grid. Do you see all these spots? And these spots are not in your wherever you stare. It's in your peripheral vision, yeah? But if you look at those spots, it's not there, right? Does that make sense? Steve, can you see it? Not shake, yeah? So this is a very famous, the, 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 the periphery, you do not have this query to disambiguate what your input is. Therefore, you are easily fooled, okay? Here is another example. Rotating snake. The notice that the rotating stick is never in your central vision, yeah? So this is indeed that's the case. And here is another example that's um, called uh, four-stroke motion illusion. Let me share with you. Uh, can you see this? Yeah. So let me uh, reset. You see this illusion, you see that this, this ski slope keep moving towards you, but somehow never quite move towards you, yeah? So this whole visual field is moving towards you. What's going on? Let me show you what's going on. It's called four-stroke illusion because that basically you're recycling uh, among four images, looping through images. So let me show you what are the four images, okay? So, oh, sorry. Stop, and I'm going to step. Image number one. Oh, this is, let's, say, let's say this is image number one. Okay, image number one, two, and from one to two, it's still in, indeed stepping forward. Now the image number three, it stepped backwards, but at the same time, it reverses its contrast. Okay, image number four, step forward. So it's image number back to one. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, Four. So in each step between one and two is stepping forward, between two and three actually stepping backward. But somehow our visual system still see it stepping forward just because the image changed the contrast. Black white changed. Okay? That's another little illusion. So again, one, two, three, four. Okay? Very interesting. So why is this the case? So let me explain to you. Here is another illusion which I actually predicted from this framework. This is something in press, and this is made from a lot of homo pairs. In, in A, is a pairs of dots. And in each pair, it's the same color, either same white or same black. So these are all pairs of dots vertically aligned. In B, you also have pairs of dots vertically aligned, but they are called hetero pairs because the two dots, one black but one white, okay? And here I show you illusion. They look vertically aligned, great. However, in A, they look vertically aligned, whether you look at centrally, you stare at A, look vertically aligned, or you look at peripherally, it's still vertically aligned. In B, if you look at directly, yes, yeah, vertically aligned, but if you look at peripherally, how do you look peripherally? I suggest that you look at A, okay? You stare at A, 
but your out of the corner of your eyes, you're trying to see B. Does it look like horizontally aligned to you? you know, most of you will say, gee, I'm not convinced. Okay. Indeed, it's it's not very convincing. But if I ask subject to say you have to give a false choice, a hundred percent, almost hundred percent, they'll say it's horizontal. It's not very convincing, so let me show you an example where it's more convincing. Here's an example where it's more convincing, okay? So this is a baseline. There's no illusion in here. All of these are homo pairs, pairs of dots of the same color. And there is a ring. Do you see if you fixate here, there is a ring, okay? This is the ring. Its ring is because all other homo pairs are randomly oriented, but on this ring, these homo pairs are oriented tangential to this ring ring okay why you can see it yeah how to see is it how to see mm. you can see it yeah okay all right great and now i am going to give you another example here i just take every other homo pairs and put it become a hetero pair everything else the same okay so every other homo pair on the ring become hetero pair everything else the same Okay, you can see the ring, no problem, if you just trace of it. However, if you put I on the cross, then you are seeing it in your peripheral vision, okay? Even though it's only about two or three degree away, depending on where you sit next to your screen. So I'm taking these things away. You stare at the cross. Can you now see the ring more easily? Hmm, difficult, yeah? So if you stare at the cross here, don't, don't peek to the peripheral, okay? So you can see the ring, yeah? So stay here, you cannot see the ring. Unless you move your eye to the ring and say, oh yeah, I can see it. So somehow peripherally, these pairs of dots don't look like they're oriented that way. So if my illusion is indeed correct, I will predict that if you flip these hetero pairs 90 degrees to make it perpendicular to the tangent, then you can see it. Okay, so let's try that. So I'm going to give you another image in which those hetero pairs are perpendicular to the ring, okay? You see these hetero pairs become perpendicular to the ring. In contrast, the hetero pairs are parallel to the ring, okay? Now I'm gonna let you see it. If you fixate in the, uh, in the cross, which one is more easily to see the, see the ring? Is it here in F? Don't peek, okay? No cheating, just fixate on the cross or there in B, okay? So if you can see the illusion, you will find F is more easily. Thank you, some of you give me feedback on the, on the, on the chat, yeah? However, if you go to directly look at the rings, well, it looks like this D is more easily. So in your central vision, you directly look at the ring, D is more easily C than F. In peripheral vision, if you just look at the cross so that the ring falls in the periphery, then you cannot see the ring so easily in D as in F, yeah? So, yes, indeed, this is the illusion. And now let me explain to you how this illusion come out. That's how we predict it. We start back to human weasel. You can tell us how. So, we have neurons tuned to horizontal. Here is a Gabor filter tuned to horizontal. It has a subfield, on subfield, and off subfield. Now, imagine I put a black dot in the off subfield and white dot in the on subfield. It's going to excite this neuron happily, even though it's vertically aligned. Yeah, and of course you can put all hetero pairs or horizontally aligned, also can excite this neuron. Or two black dots horizontally aligned also excite this neuron. Or Gabor patch can also excite this neuron. So this neuron, as far as this neuron concerned, can be excited by at least these four possible inputs, yeah? However, if you give a vertically tuned receptive field, another neuron, you put this header pair in it, well, it doesn't really excite it. So therefore, if we have two neurons, one, let's call it neuron uh, Mary, the other is neuron John, the Mary neuron is excited by this header pair of vertical dots, but the John neuron is not so excited. So if you have Mary neuron firing a lot, John neuron firing not a lot, they are sending their signal to V2. What should the V2 think? Well, V2 will say, oh, something vertically, or something horizontal, because Mary likes horizontal, okay? So something horizontal, even though it's vertical. 
Then you say, wait a minute, there's not just John and Mary in the one, there's also David and Harry and Lisa, and they can have lots of other neurons, you know, what if you have, uh, you know, the field just come Then if you have population decoding, then I will tell it's, it's, it's that and not that. Well, this is if you send all information from V1 to V2. Remember we said that by V1, when you send out, information bottlenecks start to appear, so therefore you don't send all information. So imagine if your retina has this hetero pair of new, uh, dots, V1 act, activates their Mary neuron. Imagine the extreme case, Mary and John, you send this information forward and no other neurons send any information forward. And then higher visual areas say, hey, these four possibilities, but I'm not sure which. And then they will have to decide, the perceptual decision maker, decision making and say, gee, majority vote horizontal. Okay, so you can be fooled by it. Yeah, is that why uh, artificial neural networks are so uh, vulnerable to adversarial attack? That's a homework question we can think about. However, if the higher visual area say, wait a minute, I don't want to be just have make a rash decision. Let me go back and check. Now, now it's checking. Is it really this possibility, that possibility? Let's say it's only checking among one of the four possibilities. Then it will verify, say, hey, which one it is? And they check, oh, yeah, you know, it's actually uh, this one. And then if you check, you cannot be full, okay? And so, but if this checking only happens in central vision, and this checking actually, by the way, that's visual understanding. Because to check, you have to say, well, Mary likes horizontal, how does like horizontal, or unless the field, off with the field, and so on. So therefore, you kind of have this likelihood function of how the neural respond with this likelihood function is your internal knowledge of the visual world. That's in computational terms called analysis by synthesis, and that's how you can not get in fooled, okay? And this process, I kind of rewarded it, just make it easier to say it's a feed forward, feedback, and come back to verify, and then reweight the original hypothesis, and maybe that giving this more weight and giving this less weight. This you can do in central vision, but not peripheral vision, okay? And so now I, you can see I can make an analogy of what I just talk, told you about in motion perception. Now, in motion perception, uh, motion perception really is restifio oriented in space and time. So space, horizontal, time is vertical, okay? And so therefore, this neuron tilted in this orientation is preferring motion to the, moving to the right. So, for instance, here is a, is a dot at space x1, time 1, and the time 2 at space x2, so therefore it's moving to the right. So this neuron is preferring rightward motion. Whether it's a white dot moving to the right or black dot moving to the right, this neuron will be excited. However, if you have a white dot at time one at this space location, at time two, it becomes black dot. It moves to the left, okay? And this will also excite this neuron. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay? And so therefore, if you, uh, time one is one black dot, a white dot, time two is black dot, then it, it's the other direction that excites this neuron. So this is the exact analogy of this flip tilt illusion. Okay, it's a vertical one, looks like a horizontal one. He is moving right, moving, looking, moving to the left. Now we can see why we have this reverse four stroke motion. Remember, it's moving up one, two, it's moving to the forward, and then the backwards, it still thinks it's moving forward, okay, because it flipped the polarity, and then move forward. Then backward flip polarity and move forward. And this is exactly why this is called reverse fine motion comes out. Okay. And so um, this explains why this, this explains our, uh, um, uh, you, can, you, can, you can extend this flip tilt erosion in orientation to the flip tilt erosion in motion that gives you this motion illusion. And you can extend further, okay? Extending further, we can make an analogy to depth perception. In such a case, everybody, I hope you have heard about random dot stereo work. So basically random dots, okay? In the left eye and random dots in the right eye, they look completely random, except there is a correspondence in the central uh, circle. And this green circle is just illustration. It's not actually in the visual stimulus, how they are made. You start with two identical images, Okay, they are copies of each other, except then you, with, uh, then you move the central green disk. Oh, sorry. Start like that. You move. 
you have a special disparity sh shift. This will make this disc as if it's in front. Okay, if you can fuse, you will see that this disc is in front of the surrounding ring. And this is an analogy of this shift from one eye to another is an analogy of shift from one time to another time, okay? So this is an analogy in stereo vision. So two time frames now become two eyes. And that's how you can see whether it steps in front or back. Analogies to whether the movement is moving to the left or to the right, okay? And so that's an analogy. Now you can make another. It's called anti-correlated stereogram. Made the same way except within the central disc Every black dot in one eye is a white dot in the other eye and vice versa. So this is called anti-correlated. Now this is an analogy from that. Basically a white dot becomes black dot after the shift. Okay, And that means you will see anything in front, you will see in the back. That's what V1 tells you. Okay, and In fact, in physiology, this has been observed by coming and Parker in 1997, when they give a V1 neuron these kind of normal stereograms, the, the, the neuron has this disparity in training curve, horizontal is disparity, vertical is the firing rate. You see that this neuron prefers disparity 0.1 degree, and anti prefer disparity minus 0.1, okay? And this neuron actually prefer uh, things in front. But if you get, show this neuron this disparity, okay, uh, on the same disparity, but it's anti core stereogram, Suddenly the tuning curve flipped, okay, for exactly the same reason. So, and so it's been known in 1997, and so in the vision community, people say, hey, can we see it's in the back, the reverse depth? And I remember that in conferences, people try to see that they cannot see it. And then, of course, people try to explain V1 is not perception, is not consciousness, and there's many reasons to, to explain that. However, people always try to see it only in central vision, not in peripheral vision. Oh, can I see? Can they cannot see? Okay, in central vision. Now, I predict this can be seen in peripheral vision because peripheral vision can be full. So the idea is central vision, the reason you cannot see it is V1 will feed forward these uh, reverse depths, which let's call fake news. Okay, V1 feed forward the fake news to higher visual areas. And, uh, and then the top down feedback say, e, are you telling me this or that? Let me uh, verify. Okay, so top down feedback trying to verify, oh, you're getting a bit confused. And when it verify, it says, okay, if you tell me it's in the back, it should be shifted that way. And they come back and find it's not shifted that way. Worse yet, black dot with no white dot. So they say, you are telling me fibs. I don't want to believe you. And therefore, the, the V1's report will be vetoed. And therefore, whatever V1's report, you don't listen to it. That's why you don't see this reverse depth. Uh, confusion. Okay. Now, if you don't, so therefore, top-down feedback in central vision enables vision not to be easily fooled. Top-down feedback is visual understanding. So, if you don't have top-down feedback, you cannot be doing that, and therefore, you will um, you will just believe whatever you are told. That's why, if you are told it's in the back, you will believe it's in the back. Yeah. Um, and so, therefore, it is. Uh, um, uh, 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 that's why this is the case. And um, uh, after this was predicted, we then tested. This is work with a master student, Joel Eckman, who was visiting me from ETH at the time for a master uh, project. And uh, we make observers look at this, and they, they, they need to answer whether it's in the front or back. Okay, false choice. If you let them look at the directory in central vision, they this is this is for central vision and vertical axis means the accuracy in responding correct or incorrect. Of course, if they random back guess, they have 50% chance to guess it correctly. So therefore, central vision, they are just 50% correct. You know, they're really chance. Okay. However, in peripheral vision, look at them. If they look, do not look at the stereogram directly, they are much, much worse than chance. That means they completely guess the other way. Okay, so this is indeed illusion. And so therefore, it's not because V1 is not corresponding to uh, awareness and consciousness. It's just that if you look at the periphery, the signal is there, yeah? And it's fed forward to higher visual areas and which cannot go back to check. And that's why it, it, it just believe it. And of course, the same observer, there's five of them, you save them then if you show them a non normal stereogram that doesn't have flipped contrast, they can see central vision and peripheral vision just as well. Okay, they so they have no problem doing that. Okay, and so this is uh, a, a computationally 
predicted uh, illusion again, uh, and it's confirmed in behavior as well. And um, since I moved to Germany, I have the opportunity to, to learn from my colleagues as I started a FMI project. This is with many colleagues, including uh, uh, then later on my postdoc, Jing Yu, uh, Zhou joined us, and his colleagues, uh, uh, Bartos, Scheffler, and uh, Ebb, and uh, Grassi. And they, they especially uh, Grassi and Zhou, they really taught me a lot on FMI, but it's a, a, a lot of fun. And so what we do is ask the observers to do this this task in a scanner, we get their voxels, and what we do is, first of all, we decode the voxels responding to this correlated stereo, and the voxel just have to classify whether it's front or back the subject is presented with, okay? Now, once we, we make the decoding work, then we put the decoder to the voxel responses to this anti-correlated stereo, gram, and then ask the decoder, what do you see, front or back, okay? So if the decoder sees the opposite, then the decoder has the reverse depth. If the decoder doesn't, then not. And this way we can ask where in the brain, the voxels in the brain, we can actually have this reverse depth information. Okay. And so this is our preliminary result and, uh, uh, and uh, still only conference we have this. Uh, so let me share just preliminary results. Uh, indeed, yes, we find that we do have, oh, this, yeah. We do find these reverse depth signals in the brain, and in particular, it's stronger in extra striped cortical area, particularly area like V3B, which is around that area. Okay, and also um, it's stronger if you look at the things peripherally rather than centrally. So it's a less veto for top-down veto, so it's stronger. Okay, and also it's correlated to behavior because some of us can see reverse depth better than others. So if you can see reverse better. That better you can uh, use stronger, yeah. And so these are preliminary evidence uh, 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 from from FMI, and uh, we hope that this will also motivate further investigations by neurophysiologists and anatomists to see in detail how in this brain circuit you implement this feed forward, feedback, verify, and reweight, and which brain area and how you know talk to each other and so. On. And so here I just like to summarize that I like to propose this new framework where understanding vision should be um, done and maybe um, in, in light of attentional selection, which is the center stage because it really gates whatever we can recognize. And we have to, the reason it's so important is because selection starts as early as V1 and uh, something we cannot ignore. And starting from V2, we have to think that way. And just measure with the feel uh, in a feed-forward manner doesn't work as well if you don't consider the other way. And so you have feed-forward feedback process that's mainly in central vision. And peripheral vision, you have less so. And this, uh, you know, maybe why in peripheral. By the way, in peripheral, it's not just uh, uh, you are having less visual resolution. In this case, you can see something in periphery that you cannot see in central, right? So certain illusions you can see, the periphery actually has something smarter than central vision. It's not just poor resolution. But on the other hand, you can say it's something dumb, you know, get easily fooled. So therefore, you can actually use illusion as a tool to probe vision driven by computational motivations. And illusion is one of those treasured, you know, treasures in our vision science we collected over hundreds of years, now they can contribute in a unique way for this computational motivated driven way, combining behavioral research, physiological research, and computational approaches to understand vision in this new framework. And I'd like to close by thanking my collaborators, and these are just uh, uh, only a few of my collaborators, especially whose work have been mentioned in this talk, and many others whose work uh, are not yet, uh, not quite uh, included in this short talk. And if you're interested, join us and uh, also uh, in our team, as well as, you know, we can just as a, as a community uh, try to, uh, in this new framework, to, to test it, to falsify it, and to improve it. And so to hopefully make more progress. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to move into the question period. Um, I'm going to unfocus your screen here. 
Um, okay, so uh, it, for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, pose some of the most highly ranked questions. Uh, and please, for everyone, if your question is not answered, if you have follow-up questions, there is another question period later today. So without further ado, the top ranked question is, how do you arrive at the 40 bits per second mentioned in the visual data? Oh, very good. So sorry. In fact, this 40 bits per second, I did not arrive. It's actually data uh, uh, taken in 1950. So it was actually a long, long time ago. It turns out that in 1940s, you have Shannon had this information theory and it became such so popular that people start to measure information uh, capacities in telephone networks, radio stations. And then people say, hey, let's measure the information capacity in human cognition. So what they do is more or less just giving the visual images to humans, more or less like ISVP streams of visual flash cuts very quickly and how much you can flash. And then they can estimate just using these traditional information uh, uh, estimations. And it's beautiful work in 1950s, but somehow um, maybe it was, again, you know, we, we probably thought it was something really high level in vision, somehow never thought it could be uh, so important. That's why I said the elephant in a room it may be very difficult to, to appreciate. It's right there uh, so early. You know, we kind of back in our brain think there is this information bottleneck. And it's kind of delegated to the to the psychology department, the higher cognitive science, you know, co cognition, high level psychology. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, this is, uh, uh, in fact, at the time, first time it was measured 40 bits per second, people find it quite skeptical. And uh, then people repeated that. And some people get a 100 bits per second, and 40 bits per second. It's repeated in 1950, multiple. Uh, yeah. OK, great. Thank you. Um, I think there was another question here. Yeah, and it, it's, yeah, so I'm going to go down to this question. So what is the reason for the information bottleneck by V1? Are we already through the visual bottleneck, et cetera? So why another, oh, sorry, you bumped, moved around. So why another okay. one, something, something to that effect? Okay, so there, indeed there's a bottleneck in optic nerve. Can you see my screen? Or oh, anyway, you don't have to see the screen. So at optic nerve from uh, retina to LGN to, to V1, the optic nerve is already a bottleneck. And that bottleneck is not as, in fact, you can estimate how much is that by the, the neural firing variability and so on. So it turns out that each neuron can have, let's say, you know, uh, more or less one spike per, per, per bit. So each neuron can have uh, quite a lot. Uh, maybe, uh, um, let's say one bit per second, okay? One bit per second. So 100 million, uh, one million neuron, you have a uh, one million bit. Well, in fact, each neuron doesn't fire more than one, one spike. So each neuron can have 10 bits. So 100, 100, uh, one million neuron, you will have um, one megabytes. And so the bottleneck in retina optic nerve is one megabytes. And that's much, much bigger than 40 bits per second. Why do we need this another bottleneck? Well, uh, I would argue that if you let the whole megabytes of information are processed, maybe our brain wouldn't have enough resource to do so. Yeah, you know, our brain will be huge, we'll use lots of blood. You know, our brain uses already 25% of our blood, even though it's only about one kilo. And so therefore, maybe energy make us not able to do more. So that's why another bottleneck. OK, thank you. OK, so there's another question here with eight votes. How is the V1 saliency hypothesis related to brown suppression? For example, cross inhibition across columns. Is it a reformulation of the idea, or did I miss something? No. Uh, um, so we know that we are computational. We need a computational uh, and algorithmic, you know, David Mars, uh not the three stage of vision, but three levels of, of analysis. One is computation, one is algorithmic, and one is implementational. V1 saliency hypothesis is a computational hypothesis. Then you say, what is the algorithm? The algorithm level is the like-to-like -like suppression, which is the surround suppression you can implement in many different ways. You can implement by the neurons, V1 neurons. You can also implement in your computer software. It's not, a, doesn't matter, yeah? And so therefore, uh, 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 implementation-wise, whether you have, uh, you know, one is implement, it's not replacing it. It's not an idea, it's information detail. Idea is the V1 saliency hypothesis. 
Does that does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and so that's uh, uh, and uh, uh, yeah. So one is a uh, computational, one is uh, implementational. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So okay. I am just following up here uh, to see if we could have a follow up question. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next question in the, the spirit of time. Uh, so another question here, what is the role of cortical feedback in the periphery in this framework? Okay, in this framework, we are saying the cortical feedback in the periphery is less. Um, because if it's just as abundant feedback, then it cannot be fooled so easily in the periphery. The reason that in the periphery is easily fooled is because it doesn't have feedback, yeah? as much and so the so the role of feedback is it doesn't have as much feedback as in uh as in central vision yeah Great. so Great. uh so for instance this uh, uh illusion in the in the reverse depths you know it, it gets fooled because it cannot verify that it's it, uh, that it's fake news about depths is in the other way around yeah, does that make sense? And same thing as in a in a flip tilt illusion, that you will see the flip tilt. So if you de zoom my, oh, you already de zoomed it. Um, so no, it's it's you're you're back on the your your screen is being shared large. Great, thank you. So yeah, it's it's like. As I said, this feedback is only mainly in central vision. Because it's mainly in central vision, you don't have feedback. That's why only if you feed forward. So in periphery, there's less feedback. And that's why you will believe in the majority vote. You know, three, so, the, so when the forward says, Mary Neuron says, hey, I'm excited. And then the higher visual area say, oh, Mary Neuron likes horizontal. Oh, there could be these possibilities of horizontal. The majority of them say horizontal, so I believe horizontal. And this, you people probably have heard about adversarial attack in artificial neural networks. The artificial neural networks, most of them are feed forward. And if you know that feed forward, they have convolution and max pooling. A lot of these max pooling is, in fact, losing information. You can lose information is maybe a negative term. The positive term is creating invariance. Okay, it's spatial invariance. Creating invariance and losing information are the same thing. Lose information, that's why you get fooled. And so uh, adversarial attacks. Uh, uh, but if you have feedback, uh, which then it will be very expensive to have a lot of feedback. To, if, we, if we have n neurons in the brain, if you have all to all connections, you will have n square fibers. So therefore, by not having as much feedback, uh, in periphery, you actually save a lot of neural fibers, so our brain is not so heavy, so we do not waste too much resources. Yeah. Okay. okay, so we have, uh, I think, time for one more question. I'm going to skip down to the, the second one here because I think it's actually related to what you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. Does the winner-take-all like-to-like inhibition depend on the patches in V1? Would it fail in animals that have a salt and pepper map? Uh, salt and pepper is just, an, um, I, I would think it was still applied to animal with salt and pepper map. The reason is, imagine you are in a general physics laboratory, you wire up the circuit, and then you say, I'm going to wire the circuit in such a way that, you know, all the circuit elements for the uh, capacitor put here, all the circuit elements for the resistor put there. But it really, you know, basically this is the clustering of, of elements, yeah. But, but it doesn't really matter as long as the same wiring, okay, as long as the same wiring, it can be salt and pepper, uh, even though uh, salt and pepper may be, um, so in principle, it doesn't matter. You can still have like-to-like -like suppression. It looks like in mice, in rodent, they also find these like-to-like -like suppression. However, I'm not sure whether in mice it's the same saliency map as in primates because in mice, um, even though they have to like write expression, they, their neurons with the field are like 20 degrees wide. So if they have the saliency map, they are not very um, high resolution. 
uh, while primates, these neurons uh, V1 or V2 have very small the field. You can really have higher resolution saccade. And this may be related to the fact that um, uh, the, the mice do not do as much saccade. They don't do saccade, but they move their head a lot. So in central peripheral dichotomy, we talk about we primates move our gaze, mice move their head. So their fovea really is they move their head to orient to their fovea. Their fovea may not be the, the fovea in the brain. This is the fovea in terms of maybe their whiskers is their fovea. This is the general to other sense. Okay, central peripheral are general to other sense. Their whiskers, their, their snout, their uh, olfaction, is where they focus for detailed feed forward feedback analysis maybe maybe their vision is the peripheral vision peripheral vision of course they also don't have so much of a foveal pit and so therefore uh, the central peripheral uh, 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 dichotomy it will be have to be uh, modified however i argue that despite that as computational we like to see universal principles so the, the idea of the framework is that encoding, selection, and decoding can be generalized to the whole sensory system. Okay, you may encode through one sense and you select somehow, and then you decode on the same sense or use different senses. Yeah, yeah. and so uh, this we can, uh, um, as, as a starting point, let's, let's hope at least this can serve as a stepping stone for something a better framework and we, we should falsify it or improve it in that way. Wonderful. Okay, we we are at past a little bit past the one hour mark, so I think we should end here. My apologies to those people who did not have their questions asked, but as I mentioned before, there is another Q and A period later. Uh, so I, I think we'll just roll these questions forward, uh, and and to those even those questions that were addressed. Um, if you have follow up questions or want to have you know a deeper dialogue on this, uh, please join us for that later session. Um, and with that, I'd like to again thank our speaker, as I'm sure everyone else has done. I saw lots of claps in the chat uh, on the side. Uh, so thank you very much. And I hope to uh, see you again later today uh, for the, the follow-up Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I look forward to the, to the next session. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk.